so glad you're here with us because on the Clark Howard Show, we're about your empowerment with knowledge so that you can make better financial decisions in your life. Today, we begin with my favorite segment every week, Clark Stinks. Something else I think stinks, potentially stinks, Medicare Advantage plans. And as it turns out, a lot of people who thought they were making a good choice later burns them really badly. I'm going to tell you what you need to know if you, a friend or family member, are approaching 65 where you have to make a key choice for your health care from the government moving forward. I'm going to tell you what you need to know. But right now, it is time for Clark Stinks. You don't stink, but your recent comments on shoplifting totally ignored the elephant in the room, why shoplifting is happening. The reason it's now an epidemic is that it can be done with impunity. Shoplifters are almost never arrested, and if arrested, they are not often prosecuted. Dollar levels for felony shoplifting are frequently so high that stealing hundreds of dollars of merchandise is petty larceny, which is ignored by police in many communities. If shoplifters were aggressively arrested, vigorously prosecuted, fined and jailed, and if felony dollar levels lowered, we wouldn't need to lock merchandise behind glass. And that's from Brian. Brian, thank you. No doubt what you said is a part of the picture. Uh, Unfortunately, in jurisdictions also where there are tighter controls on when uh, shoplifting becomes a serious crime, the shoplifting is also a problem. But but, uh, there is no doubt that in areas that have essentially decriminalized low-dollar threshold shoplifting, it's led to a plague of it. And this is, I don't know what people were thinking about with this because that makes no sense at all to me. I'm a big believer in the broken windows theory of policing, which is when you tolerate low level crimes, it leads to crime creep in a city, a community, in an area. Speaking of police, this one came in. I was driving my police car and almost projectile vomited listening to your praise of firefighters. Could you carry the firefighters any further? You said they're typically the first ones there. 90% of their calls aren't even fires, blah, blah, blah. Ah, police cars are way faster than fire trucks, so we do get there first. Police are out proactively preventing, then responding, often already being close to the call. Not chilling in our residential office in shorts and flip-flops, applying armor all to our tires, reacting to calls. 99% of those 90% non-fire calls, firefighters won't even show up until the cops say it's safe. Regardless of the size of the cop, short and to the point, sending some good banter to our firefighter friends. I'm tired from working my entire 12-hour shift. Keep it up, Clark. Love and apply your knowledge, Wes. <laughs> Wes, I think there was some jest towards the mm-hmm. firefighters. Uh, and how should I say this? That I appreciate and feel gratitude to all first responders of various types. And firefighters, it is true that somewhere, depending on the jurisdiction, 97 to 99% of calls are not fire related. But I want you to think about it. Who in their right mind has the courage to run into a burning building? Because even if it's 97% of the time, that means your number's gonna come up where there's that burning building. And I am very impressed with the bravery of firefighters and of course, police officers as well. Definitely. Aldi, your favorite, really, Clark? I'm currently visiting Chicago for my first time, and while driving to our rental, we see an Aldi six minutes away. I told my wife that Clark Howard loves that store. Let's go there for our breakfast food, because we always cook breakfast while traveling to save money. We were excited going in, disappointed going out. I'm not going to get into all the many reasons for my disappointment, but suffice it to say, I will be willing to bet you get as good or better prices at Target's Market Pantry slash Good and Gather and with superior quality along with better shopping experience. 
Obviously, Kirkland's signature would be best, but not really a fair comparison to Aldi. Come on, Clark. Some things just aren't worth saving a nickel. Thanks, and you really don't stink. I just wanted to have some fun with you, Greg. Greg, I, I, I still remember something very clearly. When Aldi was uh, newer in the United States, they first came but had not a lot of stores. They came, I think, in the mid to late 70s, maybe, in the United States, but really only became part of the public consciousness in the last 20 years. And I remember I was at a uh, speech and book signing event in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I don't know if you were at that event with me, Krista. And Aldi came up. Somebody was asking me how I felt about Aldi because they were new in that market. And I asked, well, how many of you have ever shopped at Aldi? And, you know, a huge number of hands went up because they were, I mean, they were interested in a Clark Howard event. They're thrifty. And then I said, how many of you like Aldi? <laughs> and a much, much smaller number of hands went up. I mean, it is an acquired taste. And obviously, it's not for you. But I do love Aldi. So much so that I wanted to name our dog Aldi. But on social media, you voted me down. And so now it's Kirky, Kirkland Signature. He's adorable. <clears throat> what is that smell? Is it the smell of misinformation? Ooh. On an episode, you were talking about cell phone plans and coverage while abroad. You mentioned that none of the big three operators, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, provides that coverage. That is not true for T-Mobile. I've been a customer of theirs for a decade precisely because of their great no-roaming fees international coverage in over 200 countries. And then in the end, keep up all the great work you do, but try not to make generalizations without all the information, Sebastian. Sebastian, I am actually a T-Mobile customer. I recently returned from a trip overseas. And as I have for years, I've used T-Mobile's international coverage, but now it's capped at five gigs of data for the time you're overseas. And someone who's trying to do a lot of work overseas will go through five gigs of data probably before their trip is up. And then T-Mobile at that point starts charging you uh, really high data rates if you choose to buy them from them, just like the outrageous rates from AT&T or Verizon. The good news with T-Mobile is they do cede you that five gigs of data, which my son who was with us on this trip managed to go through five gigs of data in how long, Krista? Five minutes. <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, I thought I told you this, oh. that he went through five gigs of data in 10 hours. I don't even know how that's possible. Wow. Well, streaming and everything for sure. Um, and I remember the call that I think Sebastian's referring to or the segment um, and that you had said the unlimited data not offered by them. So maybe. Right. The only company that. that offers unlimited data overseas is if you're with the um, Google Fi Google folks. Fi. And Google Fi, your service works outside the United States, just like it works inside the United States. And if you're on an unlimited data plan in the United States, you have unlimited data overseas. And who knows how long Google Fi will continue to offer it, but it's quite a deal. On the September 18th podcast, there was a discussion about selling prim a primary residence after renting it out while traveling in an RV. The statement was made that you have to have five years to, that you have five years to sell the property to avoid capital gains tax. First, it has to be your primary residence for three of the last five years, so you really only have 36 months to sell it. Also, the IRS has a formula to calculate how much of the gain on the sale is tax-free based on years owned in total as a rental and then as a primary residence. It would be best to meet with a tax advisor to discuss the details. Love your show, Clark, but be careful with the details when it comes to income tax issues. Ryan. Ryan, thank you. And your, the thing you said was about what was going to come out of my mouth, and it's 100% what I should have said at that time. You need to go meet with a CPA who does tax or an enrolled agent before you embark on something like that with a uh, transition of a primary residence being turned into a rental property temporarily. And there actually is a workaround that will preserve the greatest tax benefits, but that's why you go to a CPA who does tax or an enrolled agent. But your explanation of three of the last five is exactly right. And in the scenario you gave, you're also right. There would be a 36-month cap on how long you could rent it. 
Clark stinks worse than a law office lottery winner billboard. His recent discussion on increasing auto insurance rates failed to mention the impact of frivolous lawsuits generated by the many law offices encouraging suits at every turn. One claims $15 billion recovered. Another just wow. says billions. They use the term one or he got me millions. In all cases, these payouts fail to mention how they impact all, us all in our insurance rates. Yes, there are serious accidents where compensation is warranted. However, most just make arguments that aches and pains were caused by the accident, then force the insurance providers to pr prove otherwise. If they were legitimate, they wouldn't need their own doctors, chiropractors, pain management, etc. It's a scam by any measurement that requires more regulation, but in the meantime, let's all include it as a significant cause of these insurance increases we all pay. Philip. Philip, thank you. And it, although it varies by state how much of what you end up paying for auto insurance is because of the, um, the uh, what do they call the, the contingency fee lawyers who run all those billboards and TV ads and all that. And I'm a big free speech guy. I hate that the Supreme Court said that lawyers were allowed to advertise because I think it has debased the legal profession and has probably, to some percent, led to the increased cost of insurance. I certainly can't disagree with that. I couldn't put a number on it. Clark stinks as bad as a bottle of formula found a month ago under the couch. Oof. The other day, Clark spoke about longevity insurance but failed to call it what it really is, an annuity. Annuities get a bad rap, but they are just another tool that can be used to help someone meet their retirement goals. Is Clark really that scared to say annuity or deferred income annuity, which is what he was talking about? Longtime listener and appreciate the education Clark provides regarding personal finance, Dave. Dave, thank you. Yes, a, de a deferred annuity, longevity annuity, an immediate payout annuity, they are all annuities. Annuity is a cuss word on our podcast, which is tough because we're a family-friendly show and it's tough to have cuss words on it. Um, but these annuities, I believe, are an exception to what I normally say because an immediate annuity is one that allows you to create a equivalent to a pension of a lifetime stream of income. And then if you do the longevity annuity, it means you don't face a point in your older age where you run out of money before you run out of life. Yes, they are annuities, but they are a very different thing than the index annuities that are so heavily pushed and the variable annuities of various types. And so I put them in a different category. Most insurance agents don't want to sell these that I'm talking about because the commissions are so tiny. You don't stink, but I think you glossed over the value provided by premium travel credit cards. I have the Venture X and don't spend anywhere near $60,000 a year. The $400 annual fee is easily made up by the $300 travel credit and 10,000 miles I receive annually. This is in addition to global entry TSA pre-check reimbursement and priority pass lounge membership, all of which I have been able to take advantage of. The benefits are more straightforward to recoup than the Byzantine structure of the Amex benefits, too. It's an excellent card if you frequent in airports have priority pass lounges. My spouse also gets access as an authorized user for no additional fee, at least for now. Thanks for all you do, George. George, um, gosh, that's why we have on Clark.com the Capital One Venture X is one of the best cards you can get hands down if you like to travel. I have that card. I pay the $395 annual fee. We have the additional family cards that you get for free, but you get the benefits. The card is, I know it's weird to say to someone who doesn't live in this kind of space, the card is underpriced at $395. And at some point, Capital One will get the number of customers that their goal was, and then they're going to start pushing up the fee. Right now, hands down, Capital One Venture X is the best travel rewards card you can get, in my opinion. But maybe George is right in saying George, that $60,000 right. in charging. The 60000 I normally talk about is connected to the airline cards. You know, if you become a captive of Delta American United, their cards... Um, there are very few circumstances, and the Capital One Venture X is absolutely an exception 
where if you travel even just a few times a year, you can make the Capital One Venture X work for you at net zero cost. Clark and his staff destroy Clark's legitimate criticism of Vanguard, but first by Clark referring to Vanguard's headquarters in Malvern, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia as farm country. Then the staff, via Clark's newsletter, compounds the destruction of credibility criticism by misquoting Clark placing Vanguard's headquarters in Virginia farm country. Come on, gang, just put in a little effort to getting it right. When you don't get your facts right, you undermine the efforts of us long-term Vanguard clients trying to encourage Vanguard via multiple avenues to improve their game. Sent from Texas, geography is still taught in this state. How about yours? I bet you a hundred bucks you don't have the nerve to read this on the podcast, Bruce. Bruce? Bruce, you, you should make a donation to Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, now you got to make a donation to Habitat <laughs> because when I saw the, the, the newsletter, newsletter quote, post that said that I had said Vanguard was based in Virginia, I was like, oh, You called me no. immediately. Yeah, and we did, we did issue a correction. A, we, a correction and an apology. Um, I don't even know how that clerical error happened, but whatever um, – yeah, and I'm sorry if that undermined the credibility of what I'd said about Vanguard. And I'm speaking to uh, a group in uh, Maryland, which is <laughs> next to Pennsylvania, uh, very soon, who are going to hear what I have to say about the good and, the from the customer service standpoint, the very bad going on at Vanguard right now. So I apologize for our clerical error referring to them as being from another state bordering uh, Maryland in Virginia. But anyway, uh, I, I tell you, we try to avoid errors because we never want to erode any of that trust you have with us. And I just hate that happened. Is that it? That's it. Wow. More coming next week. Yeah, we need more stinks. Maybe I just talk too much after the <laughs> post. Maybe. I'm sorry. You That's should tell fine. me, Clark, you stink. You're talking too no, much. No, it's all good. Okay. Coming ahead, I'm going to tell you why all the pitches for Medicare Advantage pretty much stink. And you need to know what that is, and you need to know what to be on the lookout for. I got a key warning for you. If you are approaching age 65... Or if you are someone with a family member or friend, uh, maybe a parent who's coming up on 65, need you to give them a warning as clear as day that their mailbox, traditional mailbox, the kind you go and they send postal service deliver stuff, will be overrun with a volume of mail that I don't even know how many trees it takes out. When someone's approaching age 65, they're going to get strong-armed with pitches trying to get you to not go into traditional Medicare and instead go into something that's a hybrid, a private public thing called Medicare Advantage. Keep this in your mind. I call it Medicare disadvantage because Medicare Advantage plans will be pitched as they are the greatest thing ever that has ever happened in your life. And they're trying to lock you in, hook you in when you turn 65. Because it is Hotel California. You can check out, but you never leave once you've gone into one of these Medicare Advantage plans. Here's the story. If you go into a Medicare Advantage plan when you turn 65, whatever illnesses you have, they have to cover them. But once you're in... And let's say you develop some kind of illness or whatever. You're their prisoner. And they can really degrade the benefits over time. And you're still their prisoner because nobody else wants you anymore. And the overwhelming number of people who go into an Advantage plan tell pollsters they're happy. I saw an item recently in Kiplinger that 70% of Advantage plan members are glad they went into it. Okay, but I want you to think about that. 30% of people being in something that could be life and death regret the decision they made and they can't get out? I mean, be fine with Medicare Advantage if you could 
bolt on them, but that requires states of which only a handful have the right for you to get out and go into somebody else regardless of pre-existing condition. But see, the trap that these advantage plans set in most states that you can't get around is that once you're in, you're stuck because nobody else is going to take you as you age because you may have this wrong with you, that wrong with the other wrong with you. With traditional Medicare, you choose who you see, what care you get, and the rest. You go into an Advantage plan, they tell you who you can see, when they're going to cover this, when they're going to cover that. And the worst is if you end up with a really bad disease, let's say a form of cancer, and they don't have any facility or oncologists in the plan that are considered to be good or cutting edge or whatever, if you want to go get good care, you got to pay out of pocket, which you may not be able to afford to do. Advantage plans should be portable. You should be not have to worry about this loophole where states, most states have not done anything about this, that you are permanently imprisoned in what could seem up front to be a good plan and later turns out to be garbage. Garbage that could cost you your life. So I understand why people are pulled in, lured in to the Advantage plan. Because then, many times, you're not having to pay monthly fees like people go into regular Medicare, which is roughly, I think, 50, 60% of people are in regular Medicare. Because then you've got to buy what's known as a Medigap policy, which you're having to pay a monthly premium for that covers expenses that Medicare itself doesn't pay for. Medigap plans aren't cheap, but you retain your freedom. So if something did go wrong with you and you needed to see or wanted to see this specialist or go to this hospital or this cutting edge cancer center or whatever, you're able to make that choice. But if you're in an advantage plan, you can't. And so for these reasons, that's why I call them disadvantage plans. And by the way, every time I talk about this, we get a huge number of posts from people who love their Advantage plan and are happy they're in. And I think that's great. And I'm glad you're there. But the lack of portability, the lack of mobility is a marketplace flaw with how the program is set up and the way the law works. And so if you had that portability and you wanted to go into an Advantage plan, Great, but have something that could be life and death and 30% of people wish they weren't in it, that's a problem. You know, it makes me think about when someone will tell me like there are certain insurance companies, like there's one auto insurance company that has a terrible reputation. And my friend was like, I love them. I don't know why you think they're so bad. And I was like, have you ever had a claim? And they're like, no. <laughs> Right? Because you love them until something until, happens. Until the rubber meets the road. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jean in Georgia says, my dental office wants a copy of the front and back of my driver's license. Should I let them take it or not? I've gone to them for 20 years now. Yeah. Isn't that weird? You could have a long time relationship with a medical office, a dental office, whatever. And you go in there and they know who you are. Mm -hmm. But they're still now required in order to get reimbursement from whatever dental insurance you have to be able to prove they have a uh, valid government ID and driver's licenses, those, those devices, they have it all doctors and dentist offices now, uh, digitally record the front and the back. And if they don't do that, and for whatever reason somebody says, no, that wasn't me, whatever, they can't provide that driver's license or other form of government ID, they don't get the insurance reimbursement. So that's why it's going on. Sherry in California writes, I had a water supply line break in a wall, flooding my closet, oh. and I called my home warranty company. They weren't able to get a plumber to come for a week. I called back and was told that I could get a plumber myself and request reimbursement, reimbursement which I opted for. 
I completed the form with their rep on the phone. I asked what I needed to do and provide. I was told I had to submit the receipt and that was it. Now, two and a half months later, no reimbursement, and I was informed that because I didn't wait for further authorization, I was denied for reimbursement. I was told to go ahead and get a plumber myself. What was I waiting for? I was told it was in the policy that I should have waited for a go-ahead. And then she names the warranty company. I also want to say, like, I get so many questions. We get a lot of questions, and mostly the Consumer Action Center, our team, Clark, handles them. But so many people asking, which warranty company should I go with? You know, should I buy a home warranty? And what's been my answer for as long as you've known me? No, save the money yourself. Yeah, you you are your own home warranty company. You have your own emergency fund for your house. Whatever that premium is that you thought was buying you false peace of mind, that money instead goes into your own savings account that is targeted and funded specifically for the oops that occur as a homeowner. So what do you do now? First, let me give a suggestion to others. Whenever you are doing customer no service with a warranty company, usually you can do some kind of chat or text. You always want that digital record. And if they don't let you store that, take a picture of the chat so that later when they say, oh, we didn't authorize that, you have that right there. A phone call, you got nothing. And this is a constant refrain with the warranty companies. They do the rope-a-dope. You try to get them to send somebody, whatever professional, and they say, oh, can't do it yet, can't do it yet, can't do it yet, can't do it yet. And eventually they hope you cave and you forget the warranty and you just pay for it. In this case, it was more dishonest and they wouldn't send somebody, wouldn't send somebody, wouldn't send somebody. And then they told you, oh, but you can hire your own person and get reimbursed but you have no proof of that. What do you do now? File a complaint because all these warranty companies have a license with your state insurance department. You're in California. California's insurance department is one with real teeth. You file a complaint against the warranty company and then they will send on an insurance commissioner inquiry to the warranty company. And I can't guarantee you it will get it paid but it will improve the odds. But remember this, home warranties, if you got lucky and had a home warranty company that actually paid your claim, here's what you should do. When there's a big lottery jackpot, you go buy a ticket because you're as lucky as somebody who wins a billion dollars in one of those big gamey Powerball-y things, <laughs> whatever they're called. Anyway, I think that's what they're called, the big game yeah, powerball Yeah, power Yeah. <laughs> anyway... Um, save your money, it'll be in your own account, and you will have that money working for you, not for them making false promises to you. Bob in Hawaii says, my daughter is getting married 12 months from now, and we are willing and able to pay for it. We have discussed a budget. What is the best way to track and pay for expenses? I was thinking of setting up a joint checking account. She has contacted a wedding planner, and they charge an extra fee for credit card use. So we were thinking checks or Venmo. I will, incur- I will encourage her to pay with credit cards for a certain expenses per your previous recommendations. Can you recap which of those should be put on credit card? And your thoughts. Love your podcast, and I passed on a lot of your tips to friends and family. Bob, uh, first of all, if you have family or friends in Hawaii that were affected by the Maui fires, I want you to know you have my sympathies, and I, I hope that everyone who has been dislocated will find their way back to some stability and permanency in their lives. Um, On the issue of the much happier topic, Mm -hmm. your daughter's wedding, um, I have a real bias here. And that is the only check you should write is whatever amount you have decided as a couple you're going to fund the wedding for. Whatever amount of dollars that is, and give that in one check to your daughter and let her and her intended figure out how they want to spend that money. They spend less than whatever it is you've intended for because you're creating a marketplace incentive for them to spend less. Then they got money for uh, setting up their new lives together, a down payment towards a house or whatever. If they want to spend more than what you've decided would be the amount then that comes out of 
the couple's funds. The idea is so often with a wedding, there are unintended, unexpected tensions and conflicts that arise between parent and child over the cost of, a, of this for a wedding or that for the wedding or the other for the wedding. So I would like for you to write that check and stay out of it. I promise it leads to much more family harmony. My oldest, I only have one child who's married, and we did this for her and gave her and her um, now husband a set amount of money. They ended up doing a wedding for a third of that cost and used all that money towards down payment for their home. Everybody's got their own values about how they want to do it. But that inevitable conflict between parent and child that's why I would just do the cash. Now, as far as how to pay for things, even if you have to pay extra, paying deposits and things like that on a credit card, they should do that. Uh, Krista has told the story over the years many times about how her wedding photographer went poof, mm -hmm. and she has no pictures of her wedding at all. Uh, and it's because... Uh, is the worst because she paid the money and it well, did up get with the no proof pictures. so it's fine i was able to digitally scan and stuff so it worked out even okay. though they say on them proof only or whatever they don't they don't know i'm i had like actual printed proofs i so. didn't know i don't know yeah. i ever heard there was yeah i didn't get the, the album and all the other stuff i was i paid for and was promised but okay yeah uh, but wedding deposit should be paid by credit card even though they charge you three percent extra because there are some protections that you have for failure to deliver goods and services that are not ironclad, but you pay deposits with Venmo, you pay with cash in different ways, you pay with the check, you got no rights at all. So that's why the credit card is so valuable. And you did do a great job raising your daughter and all your kids with your money values, but she also married someone who makes you look like... Oh, well, I look like <laughs> the biggest spender that's ever walked the face of the earth. I appreciate how thrifty he's he is. He's great with money. Okay. Yeah. Jana in Pennsylvania says, I just listened to the episode where you mentioned the tip about Kindle first reads. I wanted to make sure you also knew about Prime Reading, where you can choose from a pretty wide selection of books to borrow for free. You can also earn credits toward Kindle books if you choose a slower shipping method on an order sometimes. And Did you know true. about that? I, kn Jana? I knew about that, but I hadn't really looked through that recently. So I'm going to look through my... Through the prime reading because yeah, I am because, a prime I mean, you've even painted that space at your house with Amazon's logo no, since I, the like truck I said, is in your house every day. So you should be taking advantage of all the prime all of benefits. Them. Well, what I'm doing is, yes, I should be taking advantage of that. But I have, like I said in that prior episode, I've been using the Libby app with my library and I have not paid for a book in so long. I've just, I'm on all these hold lists and as they become available, I read all these books for free. So it's definitely saving me money. But I am a Prime member. But Krista is a woman of letters. You are an intellect. You, uh, oh, please. You, I mean, you read more than anybody I know. I don't know how you still have perfect vision. Uh, I don't. And I love to read. I do. You do love to no, read. No, I need readers now. It's over. I mean, I had LASIK, too. You know that. Yeah. So you wear, you wear the... The, I have to wear readers when I'm reading so they're, small they're print. they're clear on the top and they're... No, no, because I do have, like, I got LASIK, so I don't have nearsightedness anymore, but I do wear readers now when the print is small. And in restaurants, I'm always like, why is it so much darker in restaurants than it used to be? But actually, <laughs> it's my eyes. Well, I want to thank you for being with us today. And I want to tell you the post here from Jana about giving more information about how to uh, leverage the membership in Amazon and get free reading and all that. That's exactly what being a member of Team Clark is about. We all help each other. We all learn from each other. And with the Clark Stink segment earlier this podcast, why do I love Clark Stink so much? Because it's normal for someone to become a creature of habit and, and their, their mind just narrow over time. And what Clark Stinks does is it's kind of like a, a wake-up therapy for me. It gets me thinking wider, thinking of angles I didn't think about, uh, improving on what I can do as we all work together to help each other achieve more power in our lives, more independence in our lives. And so I appreciate you 
taking the time, even when I've made you so mad. Like sometimes when you write the Clark Sinks, I can tell you're really, really upset with me. And I want to thank you for in that moment taking the time to share what you felt and what you think because we all help each other in life. We either all benefit from working together in life or we lose something when we live in an isolated bubble. And that's not our thing. We want us all to work as one team. And I hope you have an absolutely great weekend. And whoever your team is, I hope that when toe meets leather this weekend, that your team is victorious, whether it's NFL or that inferior thing you love, Krista, <laughs> college football. See you next week.